Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And it is Wednesday, March 10th. And uh, we are starting with a committee bill, uh, which is uh, a study in it from um, H128. Um, and then also is looking at amending our uh, current law on hate motivated crimes. Um, I'd like to start with the study language. Uh, when we were working on H128, we all agreed that that was very important information. Um, however, uh, the language of the reporting needed to be worked on and we did wanna get H128 out at that time. So we put the, um, the reporting language to the side and I very much appreciate uh, James Pepper, um, CRG, a number of uh, folks got together um, as well as the sponsors of H128 uh, got together over the break and then um, in the past few days and did um, propose language which Bryn has incorporated and that is in draft 2.1 which we'll be looking at. And so good morning uh, Bryn and we'll start with a walkthrough of that please, thank you. Maxine, before we start, yeah. I'm, drawing, I'm drawing a blank on CRG. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Crime Research Group. Oh, thank you. Right. Okay. Right. Did I get it right? Yeah, I know. I, I should have spelled it out, but yeah, thank you. Or said it. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, okay, great. Hey, good, morning, good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Uh, would you like me to share my screen so I can show you the language, um, the new language? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully you can all see I'm on page here. I'll just scroll up here. Draft 2.1 of 210932. Everyone can see that? Yep, okay, great. So um, I'm gonna jump right into the language that um, the chair just talked about that kind of was the, the origins of that were from H128. And um, these are some suggestions that were made by uh, the Office of the State's Attorneys, and I believe in connection with the Defender or the um, Attorney General's Office. So, subsection B requires an annual report. So, this is this language is dropped right into the hate motivated crime statute um, because it's an ongoing annual reporting requirement um, that deals directly with convictions of these enhanced penalties. So, we drop it right in there requiring an annual report um, starting January 1 of next year from the executive director of state's attorneys and sheriffs in consultation with the office of the attorney general. Um, the report comes directly to the house and senate committees on judiciary and it um, has to detail these three things for the prior year. <clears throat> First, incidents reported to the national incident-based reporting system in which there's an offender bias against a victim's sexuality or gender identity. Also any convictions in the criminal division of the superior court for which the sentence was enhanced pursuant to the hate motivated crime statute. And finally, any reported bias incidents that resulted in a final judgment in the civil division. Um, and then there's also a requirement that to the extent feasible, the report that's required um, by the subdivision um, she'll include any demographic information about the defendants involved in those enhanced penalties. Um, and that concludes that reporting uh, requirement. And I think you've looked at the other sections of the bill already. We have, right. And so I thank you, Bryn. So any questions for Bryn on this language? And I'm trying to get a hold of Pepper because, um, like I said, he's over. He's in Senate House Judiciary. Um, just explain how they how they came up with the different um, provisions. I don't know if if Brit, if you have any of that background while we're waiting for him or. So I wasn't involved in um, those discussions about the language. So I'm not sure um, how they how they came to that. There may have been, I don't know if there were committee members that were involved in 
crafting some of these requirements? I don't think oh. on our committee. Right, well, um, James Pepper is up next in the Senate. Let me see if I can get a hold of David. He's also down there or over there, whatever. Um, okay, thank you folks uh, for bearing with me. Okay. All right, well then I think what I'm gonna do is until we see them come on, uh, Bryn, what I'd like to do is I do see that, um, that Falco is here and he has not had an opportunity to testify at all on the bill. So if we could turn to him and Bryn, that would give you an opportunity to hear his concerns and then when, uh, and then we can come back to uh, the reporting section when, when our witnesses are available, so. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, and uh, thank you all for having me. My name, for the record, is Falco Schilling, and I'm the Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, so this, when you look at this change, this proposed change to the legislation, um, at least this, the proposed change in the hate crimes and the cross-burning sections is a small word change, but this is, as you all, I think, have figured out, a very complicated area of the law where there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of factors that need to be considered. Um, and so when you're thinking about this, where the ACLU uh, is, has need, thinks we need to balance a number of important factors. One is the clear intent to protect people from this type of discrimination, uh, which is intended and often has the effect of depriving people of their basic rights to participate in society. Um, and then at the same time, balancing that with protected constitutional rights for free speech and free association, as well as the other considerations um, around is criminalization the correct tool to be using to try and address hate speech, as well as how is this going to be implemented and will this be used in a manner that might not have been intended by the community or by the legislature in passing such a legislation and how it might in fact be used uh, in, a, in a way that discriminates against the very people that it is meant to protect. So in weighing all those factors, uh, the ACLU's policy um, is that we need to make sure that the statute is really narrowly drawn and that when looking at the, the evidence that comes in to help uh, to bolster or, or create a case around uh, a hate crimes enhancement, that that evidence needs to be very closely drawn and specifically related to the crime itself and the intentional selection of a victim for that crime, not just on general actions or protected thoughts, association, and speech that can be used to, to show a larger motivation. So um, I did submit some uh, proposed language to the committee last night that speaks specifically to this small change within the statute itself. Um, I think that this proposal uh, both gets at the intent of what the Attorney General's office was trying to do in terms of removing maliciously, but also more narrowly draws the lines around um, how what information would be gathered and helps bolster the constitutional protection. So the, the proposed language change would just, as, as you have in front of you, would just be to remove the motivated and intend instead put in language that says, um, intentionally selects the victim based on these characteristics. So I'm just pulling up the papers in front of me. Um, so Actually, um, hold, yeah, hold on, then, I want to make sure we all um, make sure it's posted and that we that we have it. Uh, I have it in my emails. Does everybody ha um, else have it? Or Evan, has it been posted? I don't know if I have it. I think I sent it along. It might have come on after five last night uh, or close to there. Uh, we've been <laughs> trying to, to figure out exactly uh, what to submit on this. So basically, so I, will, I can just walk through the actual language change very quickly if you're looking at the, the statute. Yeah, uh, or I can, I can email it. Um, 
Let's see, this is, remember, it's on your letterhead, is that it? Yep. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, why don't I email it to committee members? Uh, let's see. Sorry, folks. Uh, Sorry. There we go. Okay. Okay. Hopefully folks are getting it now. I'd also be happy just to, to read it aloud so that the folks following along at home can also hear what I'm proposing as well. So okay. um, yeah, thank you. folks have it, um, I'm happy to, to jump in. But basically, um, what we'd be asking is to change 13 VSA section 1455 to read, a person who commits causes to be committed or attempts to commit any crime and intentionally selects a victim on the basis of their actual or perceived race, color, religion, national, national origin, sex, ancestry, age, service in the US Armed Forces, dis, or disability is defined by 21 VSA, sexual orientation, or gender identity. So the rest, the, that language after the proposed change um, is all the same, but it would change the, the from saying whose conduct is maliciously motivated by the victim's actual or perceived um, factors to say, um, intentionally selects the victim on the basis of their actual or perceived race, color, et cetera. Um, so this is language that more closely tracks uh, the statute that was at issue in the Supreme Court case of Wisconsin v. Mitchell. Um, and so that is one area, that's a, one reason that we think that this uh, could be helpful in terms of strengthening the statute. Um, and it also more closely tracks with, it, it's in line with the ACLU's position that to pass constitutional muster, the statute must focus on conduct that intentionally selects the victim on the basis of invidiously discriminatory factors. So those are the reasons for the change. Um, we think that this does accomplish what the AG was trying to accomplish by removing the requirement of showing a malicious motivation, um, but also um, helps pen in the inquiry into a, into a uh, a more constitutional inquiry that is less likely to veer into protected um, things such as speech, thought, and association that might be used to show a larger motivation, but might not be directly related to the crime itself. Um, so that is that is proposed change to this actual statute. Um, we do have some concerns about the underlying statute itself and some thoughts about how that could be improved, but. This is our proposal in relation to this small change, um, specifically related to the, the mo removing of maliciously. And I can keep going, but happy to answer questions uh, at this time if that's helpful. Thank you. I do see that Selena's hand is up. Um, I, can, I can wait until you're done. Okay. Yeah. So um, moving forward, one of the, we, there are some other larger concerns about the underlying statute um, one is, I guess, kind of a belt and suspenders concern, and that one of the, our major opposition to any hate crimes legislation in the past has been that it would require inquiries into constantly protected activities such as speech and association. So one way the underlying statute could be improved would be adding language, um, and I'm happy to send over another language suggestion if this is helpful, uh, that states that evidence of expression or association of the defendant may not be introduced uh, as substance evidence at trial unless the evidence specifically relates to that offense. However, this would not affect the rules of evidence governing impeachment of a witness. 
Um, this, I think, would address what we're concerned about, but also make sure that that inquiry is more narrowly tailored and specific to the crime itself. Because what we're concerned about is we don't want to be criminalizing thought, speech, and behavior. Criminalizing actions is what this bill is looking to do, and we think this helps make that more clear, is the actions that are motivated by hate and result in a crime um, that we that are acceptable to uh, legislate in this manner. Um, the other uh, concern that we have is that this does apply to all crimes. Um, any crime can have this enhancement put on it. Uh, it's the position of the ACLU that hate crime legislation should be limited to situations where the underlying criminal conduct involves harassment, injury, or threat of physical injury to the victim, or the damage or threatened damage to the victim's property. Um, so in thinking about this, many, many, many of the crimes covered in this would fall under that category. Um, in talking to our attorneys, they did have a concern uh, specifically around the fact that this would apply to things like disorderly conduct, um, especially since we do have a criminal threatening statute, uh, which, would, which would cover most of the situations we think this would rightfully apply to. Um, so that is just a larger concern about the statute itself. Uh, I don't know if the committee is going to delve into that. Uh, but that is just one of our general concerns around this, the underlying statute as it already exists. On top of all that, some of the other considerations that need to go into uh, moving forward with legislation like this are one, uh, is criminalization the correct way to try and address, um, trying to address hate? And more and more, we've seen evidence that further criminalization might not be the answer. And we also have know that as I've testified in front of this committee and on multiple occasions, that the increased sentence lengths are one of, lengths are one of the, the primary drivers of uh, mass incarceration. So in conjunction with the, the proposed uh, report back that is in this uh, bill at this point, we think it's really important that it be tracked to see how often these enhancements are used, when they are used, and also importantly to know when they are used, the demographics of the people they are, they are being charged with these enhancements, um, there is a concern that these type of enhancements could be used um, in some situations uh, to, to actually criminalize behavior of people that they are intended to protect um, if they are, you know, could be misused. So the way that the committee would need to and the legislature would need to continually monitor these, and we appreciate the inclusion of the, the study language, um, and then also would like to take this opportunity to make our pitch for H317, which was introduced, just, uh, that's the, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Bill, uh, which we think is really important, would help further the ability to collect this type of data. Um, and I see within the proposed language, it says that the demographics will be collected when to the extent feasible. I, I understand that language, but it's also disappointing that there's times that that will not be feasible. And we think that should always be feasible um, when we're making these types of decisions and we under trying to understand the impacts um, that these types of decisions have. So to kind of sum everything up, uh, in terms of this small specific change to the maliciously motivated language, uh, we would suggest changing that to intentionally selects um, as has been shared with you. Um, and if the committee wants to delve deeper into the statute itself, um, we could provide language around limiting the evidentiary inquiry um, to the, the uh, to things that relate directly to the crime itself. Um, and we open to a discussion about the application of which crimes this should be applied to. Thank you, appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, am I correct though that at least this, for the study, you, you do support the study. I, I understand your concerns yep. about the data not, you know, yep. um, not being available, but okay, great. Thank you, appreciate it. So let's go to Selena and then Barbara. Oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, I, so I, um, I'm not sure if the language has been posted at this point, but just um, listening to you, it, it really struck me that what you're proposing creates a, I mean, yes, it eliminates the word maliciously um, as our, as this proposal does, um, but it seems like it creates a higher bar than current law for, to me, and, and with the bar being the really intentional selection of 
a victim and the language that you're proposing around that. And I wonder if you can speak to that and if that is in fact the, the intent of, behind the proposal. So I think that we think this is the appropriate bar that should be applied. This is the, the test that we believe should be applied when legislatures are passing uh, hate crime based, you know, legislation related to hate crimes and that it needs to relate to the intentional selection of a victim uh, as the basis for that enhancement. Um, so I guess it could be looked at as possibly a higher bar, but we're trying to make it clear, and this is the, the stated position of the ACLU, that this is the, the, these are the factors that should be considered in any sort of hate crimes legislation. Thank you. Are you, Selena, are you, are you good or do you have a follow up? Yeah, yeah you answer my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. I was, uh, same question. Barbara. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So um, it's interesting because I've been talking to um, a, a, not a constituent, but a Vermonter who um, I know well, who was, troubled about um, her adoptive child's brother who was being horribly like bullied and stalked in elementary school or middle school. And no one first was able to do anything. And she just mentioned to me that they um, are charging him with um, a hate crime related to stalking, I think. And I'm wondering, if that seems like one of the crimes that the ACLU would recommend um, being tied to this or not. I mean, it was related to his race. So the, the position is that we would support this being related to crimes that involve harassment. Um, so I think that would fall under that category. Thank you. Any uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing any other hands. I know we're still waiting for our other witnesses. Uh, Bryn, I just want to give you an opportunity to weigh in now if you have anything, or if not, we can we can certainly wait. Sure. Um, so I think it is will probably be helpful for the committee to hear from the prosecutor's office um, and other attorneys who may be involved in these types of cases to weigh in on <clears throat> whether or not they see this as being a higher bar. Um, I do think that the proposed changes change the elements that a prosecutor would need to prove in order to um, obtain an enhanced penalty for these types of this type of conduct. Um, I. Um, I think it's important for the committee to note that, and if I, if it's helpful, I can put it up on the screen again, or if everybody has it on another device, that the statute does require that the person um, commit a crime and that crime be, and actually the statute provides that the person's conduct has to be motivated by the victim's uh, protected status. Um, so as I understand the testimony of the ACLU, there is some concern that they want to avoid criminalizing um, the thoughts um, or protected speech of, of defendants in these situations. Um, but I just would like to point out that a prosecutor would still have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's conduct was motivated by the victim's protected status. Um, one, uh, suggestion that I can think of is to add the word criminal before conduct to make it clear that the statute requires that the defendant's criminal conduct um, has to be motivated motivated by the victim's protected status. Um, that, that may be a, another idea to, to make it clear that, um, that the legislature doesn't intend to criminalize uh, the thoughts or protected speech of the defendant. Um, I did want to point out that Title VII um, federal Title VII makes it unlawful for an employer to discriminate because of a person's protected status. Um, the Title VII use the word, uses the words because of. Um, so, and that has been upheld to be constitutional. Um, so, so I'm not sure that you need to use um, the, use that, that heightened element. Um, and 
and have the statute still be um, constitutional or upheld as constitutional because you use that motivated by. And again, the suggestion was to um, add the word criminal prior to the word conduct to, um, to ensure that the statute provides that uh, defendant's criminal conduct has to be motivated by the victim's protected status. That may be, that, that may be an alternative for the committee to think about. Okay, thank you. And can you please um, say just, or maybe um, explain a little bit more about the federal language in uh, Title VII that you just referred to? Sorry. Um, the Wisconsin case does refer to Title VII um, in its analysis. I'll just read you that that portion of the statute or of the decision. So it provides that Title VII, for example, um, makes it unlawful for an employer to discriminate against an employee, quote, because of such individuals, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And the link to that is 42 U.S. C section 2000 E um, and then it cites some cases where they rejected an argument that title seven infringed on employers first amendment rights. Um, so I, I use that as an example because it comes from this case um, that upheld the this hate crime statute in Wisconsin um, and it uses a little bit less specific language it, it just provides that title seven provides that um, that employers can't discriminate because of um, an employee's protected status, um, which is a little bit similar to the hate motivated crime statute in Vermont, which provides that defendants conduct um, be motivated by protected status. So a little bit more similar wording there. Okay. Thank you. Falco, I don't know if you wanna, wanna weigh in or you know, or not. Uh... I mean, in, in relation to the proposal of of adding criminal, that's something I'd have to take back and talk with our attorneys. Um, but yeah, I, I mostly our suggestion is one that uh, has been the position of the ACLU since 1997 um, and is more directly taken from the language of the Wisconsin statute. So um, I can't opine on whether or not the existing statute is in itself constitutional right now, but I uh, think that this could more closely track with that decision um, and is in line with ACLU positions on this issue. Okay, all right. Thank you, appreciate that. Barbara, I think your hand is up probably from before. Okay, all right. So um, committee, let's let's take a, a break, kind of uh, stay close. I know that David will be here uh, in about, five or so minutes, and I'm not sure about Pepper. So why don't we sort of stand at ease and watch our screens and um, but, you know, come back in about five or 10 minutes so we can uh, hear from our other witnesses. Okay, thank you.